just chanted the sublime attitudes, wishing happiness for ourself, well-being for others. And a very immediate way of showing goodwill for yourself is by working with the breath. The breath is the physical function that has the most immediate impact on the body, how you feel the body right now. It's very strongly influenced by the way you breathe. In breath meditation, we're not simply mechanically watching the ins and outs to lull the mind into a state of dullness. We actually want to explore the breath, work with the breath. Because it's through working with the breath that you come to understand it, and understand the mind as well. It's like any experiment. You have to play around with the parameters. to get a sense of what has an impact on what other things. You change some of the input and you find that no change happens at all in terms of the output. Other times you make slight changes here and there and the results are very different. So you want to explore the breath, experiment with the breath. Try to find what way of breathing feels best right now, what way of feeling feels most gratifying for the body and most interesting for the mind. The breath has to capture your interest, otherwise you're not going to stay with it. So try long breathing, short breathing, deep, shallow, heavy or light, and all the gradations in between to see what feels best right now. Notice which muscles of the body you're breathing. Sometimes you find that certain parts of the body carry a heavy, heavier weight in actually doing the breathing than other parts. We'll give them a vacation for a little while. Let them relax and see what other parts of the body pitch in. You can focus on the breath at any point at all in the body. It could be the nose, the middle of the chest, the abdomen, base of the throat, any spot where it's easy to see. Now the breath is coming in, now the breath is going out. And try to develop a sense of comfort at the space that you're focused on. Sometimes there's a subconscious tendency to tense up around the spot of the focus. So consciously defuse that tendency. So you can have a sense of the breath coming in easily, going out easily. There's no squeezing, there's no pressure. There's no building up of tension as you breathe in and no holding on to tension as you breathe out. Try to enjoy the breathing. Be friends with the breath. It may take a little while to get to know it. As with any friendship, it takes time. And it takes energy on your part. Inquisitive energy, trying to figure out What's the breath like now? What could I do here to help the breath? What could I do here to help the breath? When you have that attitude towards any friendship, you find that the friendship develops. And then the breath begins to show what it can do for you, in terms of giving you a good place to stay. A sense of inner well-being that doesn't have to depend on things outside, simply is regulated by the way you breathe. And when the breath starts getting comfortable, you can think of the next step. There are sixteen steps of breath meditation in all. Step number three can take a long time, but it's fun. You try to be aware of the whole body as you breathe in, aware of the whole body as you breathe out. If you find the whole body too much to take on all at once, you can try different sections of the body, focusing on one at a time and noticing how it feels. Say, around the navel. Start there and move up the front of the body, down the back of the body, out the arms, out the legs, one section at a time. Focusing on one part of the body, watching it for a while as you breathe in, watching it for a while as you breathe out, and noticing if there's any tension or tightness, just allow it to relax. If there's any sense of blockage, allow it to open up a little bit. You do this enough times and you begin to feel that the 
breathing energy in the body becomes more and more coordinated. When it's coordinated, then it's possible to focus on one spot and yet be with the whole body, breathing in, the whole body breathing out. And that one spot and the whole body feel connected. When you do this, you give the mind a really good place to settle down. The breath gets calmer as the mind gets calmer. Because after a while you, you find what kind of breathing really feels good, and you don't have to do a lot of evaluating. Just stay with the breath that feels good. And a sense of ease and rapture can come. This ease and rapture are useful in many ways. To begin with, it's easy to stay in the present moment when it feels good to be here. You find it absorbing. You find it feels really healthy for the mind. There's a strong sense of well-being that comes from simply having that sense of ease. It comes from knowing how to get the mind to settle down with the breath and be on good terms with the breath so that your awareness fills the body, the breath fills the body. And that's a pleasant place to stay. At the same time, it, the Buddha says concentration also works to develop mindfulness. All too often we hear that mindfulness practice and concentration practice are two separate things, but they're not. In the Eightfold Path, the Buddha says right mindfulness leads to concentration. If it's not leading to concentration, then it's not right mindfulness. And at the same time, medi the meditation itself helps to strengthen your mindfulness. When you look at the Buddha's descriptions of jhana, it's not until you hit the fourth jhana that mindfulness is pure. So the two qualities have to help each other along. Once there's a sense of ease, sense of equanimity that comes with the breathing, comes with the concentration. It's a lot easier for mindfulness to become established, because it's so much easier to stay here. You feel less and less inclined to go wandering off. Another function of the concentration is to give you insight into what's going on, especially in terms of attachment. Distracting thoughts come, and when there's a sense of well-being and a sense of balance here in the present moment, you feel less inclined to follow them. You look at the kind of pleasure that would come from wandering off and thinking in terms of greed or anger, delusion, lust, or whatever comes into the mind, and it just seems a lot less attractive, because a lot of the hunger that underlies that kind of thinking has been assuaged by the sense of well-being that comes from the concentration. The Buddha never said to watch out, he never warned people about being attached to concentration. In fact, it's a good idea that you get some sense of attachment here. Learn how to do it well. Learn how to make this your home. If you learn how to hold on here, then it's a lot easier to let go of the things that the mind normally holds on to, because this sense of ease, a sense of well-being assuages a lot of that inner hunger. It's like having your own independent food source, and so you're less likely to go out and looking for food from other people. All too often we hope for gratification, hope for happiness from things that other people say, other people do. It's like we're waiting for them to throw us scraps of food, and we carry them off to a corner and nibble on them. And it's a pretty miserable way of nourishing the mind. It's much better when you can have your own internal food source. And so it helps loosen up a lot of attachments. It doesn't loosen up all attachments, though, because there's a deeper part of the mind that has a hunger that's not assuaged by simple concentration, simple sense of well-being and ease. It's a hunger that comes from delusion, from not understanding what's going on in the mind. If you fully understood your own mind, there'd be no need for hunger. But it's because we don't understand how things are happening, how the different aggregates arise, form, feeling, perception, thought constructs, consciousness of objects. How do these things come? How do they go? It's because we don't see this process clearly that we create a sense of hunger in the mind. 
That can be overcome not only by concentration, but requires concentration plus insight. Say anger arises or lust arises. You have to watch where it's coming from. All too often we think that the object excites the lust or the object excites the anger, but that's not the case. The mind has this hunger to go out looking. Sometimes it's in the mood for anger, sometimes it's in the mood for lust, and then it tries to latch on to things that fit its specifications. And when the mind is in concentration, it can see this clearly. It doesn't put it into it, but you can see the process. And it's the discernment that goes together with the concentration. That's what puts it into it. In other words, on the one hand, you look at the object that excited the lust. What really is there? that's worth lusting over, or if somebody, somebody excites your anger, you really look at that person all around. You begin to realize that the lust or the anger or the greed or whatever comes from looking at things only from one side or only partially. You block off a lot of the object, and then you block off a lot of your own mind, too. When you look at the object clearly, you realize that there's nothing that really is worthy of your getting your mind get all stirred up like this. When you see that, then you can turn around and look at the state of mind itself. What is there about this state of mind that you like so much? As the Buddha once said, it's not so much our attachment to sensual objects, it's our attachment to our sensual passions that creates so much problem in the mind. Why do we like anger? Why do we like lust? Why do we like greed? It's because we think that they will feed us, provide food for the mind. But when you actually look at them, you see it's not the case. They can't provide anything at all and just make the situation worse. It's like junk food. It fills you up for a little bit and then leaves you hungrier than you were before. And as you trace these things down to their, their source, you find that you come to lots of new understandings about the mind, how the mind works, what's actually going on in there. And it's in seeing that process that undercuts the desire for these things, that undercuts the passion for these things, and at the same time undercuts that underlying hunger that even concentration couldn't take care of. But for this discernment to work, it needs a good foundation, which is what we're working on right now trying to get the mind as comfortable as possible in the present moment, as stable, as steady as possible in the present moment, so that when it looks at things, its gaze is stable and steady as well. It's like setting your scientific equipment up on a good steady table instead of carrying it around in your car. If you carry it around in the car, then no matter what the readings that the instruments give you. You can't really trust them because the car is so bouncy. You've got to get still. You've got to find something really stable to balance the equipment on. Then it can start giving you reliable readings. The same with the mind. If you want your discernment to see clearly what's going on in the mind, how the mind creates issues for itself and then suffers from its creations, it requires a good steady gaze so you're not fooled by the movements of them. Of the mind. It's like watching a motion picture. Most often we're fooled by the movement of the color. We think that when the color moves, there's actually something that up on the screen that moves. People move up there. Horses move, trains move, whatever is moving on the screen. Our, mind, our eyes follow it as if there's a real object up there on the screen. But if you can keep your gaze really steady in one spot, you see it's just flashing colors. And there's really nothing of any substance there. It's the same with the mind. All too often we're fooled by the movements of the mind. But if you look really steadily, you see that there's nothing really there. It's a lot of illusion. So to get that kind of steady gaze, you have to work on building a really solid foundation right here, which is what we're doing as we work with the breath become friends with the breath, 
get on good terms with the present moment. If you're going to settle down here, you have to be on good terms. It's like moving into any community. You've got to be on good terms with the neighbors. Otherwise, they start sniping at you, and you can't stay there. You've got to go someplace else. So as you move into the present moment, try to be on good terms with the breath. The breath is already here. The body is already here. Try to be on good terms with them so they allow you to move in, too, and settle in. So you can work on the, the real causes of that thirst, that hunger, that ignorance that keeps us going but keeps us suffering to who knows how many lifetimes. Try to dig out and find what it is in the mind. The Buddha doesn't focus on ultimate causes in terms of where the universe came from way back in time. It's what are you doing to continue creating this universe right here, right now? Because it's the process of right here, right now, where everything is happening. And once the process of right here, right now can be brought to a stop, that's when the suffering stops as well. If everything were predetermined from way back in the past, there'd be nothing you could do. You'd have to go back in time in order to redo the causes of the universe. Who could do that? But it's the fact that things are constantly created all the time, right here, right now, right here, right now. And you can deal with them right here, right now, if your concentration is steady enough, if your gaze is steady enough, if your insight is clear enough. Take the process apart. And it's this way that we show true goodwill for ourselves and for the people around us. If we're not creating suffering for ourselves, that lightens our burden and makes us less burdensome to the people around us, the beings around us. So this process of meditation is not a selfish one. It's a gift to ourselves and to everybody around us. I'm constantly amazed at how Theravada is considered or characterized as a selfish form of practice. But just look at yourself sitting here. You're sitting in a place that was given by people freely. People came up. Some people gave the money for the land. Other people gave the money for the buildings. Some people gave their strength, their abilities, their time to put this building up here to create this monastery. And they're not holding out their hand to you for donations. They gave it freely. And you're sitting here cleaning out your mind, trying to create the conditions for less greed, anger, and delusion. And if you have less greed, anger, and delusion, not only do you suffer less, the people around you suffer less. It's not that Theravada advocates being selfish, it's just very realistic. The reason we suffer, the reason we cause other people to suffer, is a lack of skillfulness and understanding our own minds. Nobody can increase our skillfulness aside from ourselves. We have to do the work ourselves. Other people can cre help create the conditions, and we should be grateful to them for it. But the best way of showing our gratitude is to practice. That's what keeps the teachings alive. That's what keeps the possibility put in into suffering alive, both for ourselves and for everybody else.